OK, I think I'll, I'll, I'll get started now. So uh, welcome everyone to the latest in our alumni masterclass series. I'm delighted that we're joined today by Peter Andrews. Uh, Peter is an award winning senior marketing lecturer. Uh, he's also the head of marketing and business strategy at Hull University Business School. He also has a, a commercial background and has worked on, on with leading organisations and, and um, on, on big commercial research projects. This is the first masterclass that we've done that has a sort of business slant and it's something that I'm, I'm, I was really excited to do because I thought that would be something that would be be valuable for people. Um, and do let us know if you'd like to see more of this sort of thing and if there's maybe other sort of business or, or other type of masterclass ideas that you have that might benefit you in your professional development. Um, but I'll hand over, oh, before I do that, um, just to let you know anyone who's who's arrived just recently, we are recording tonight. Uh, we're going to hopefully put this on YouTube and just uh, help those who weren't able to join us tonight to also get access to this uh, material from Peter. Um, there'll be a chance later on to ask Peter any questions. If you don't feel comfortable going on on mic to ask your question, we'll also I'll also manage, monitor the um, the chat box, um, and um, so there will be a chance to, uh, to to put your questions to Peter. I see Marcus is is that same joining us from from Austria. Welcome, Marcus. Uh, it's good to have you with us tonight. Uh, Peter, I'd like to hand over to you now, and um, I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. Let me just make sure that my screens that look good. Can you all see that? Yeah, that's good, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Right, OK, that's that's going to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen with you all. And um, so first of all, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Hull. I know we're online, um, but you're all alumni of Hull, which means you've got a connection with the university forever. And so, so this evening, um, I'm going to be talking through some digital marketing trends. That's the brief which I've been given. And I, and I lecture and I work with organizations in digital and social media. So I'm going to serve up to you what I think are some of the big trends that you should all be aware of. Now, this does come with a bit of a warning, and that is really you should never make predictions about anything, especially the future, because as many predictions that I get right, I also get a lot wrong. So it's quite useful to look back and see the things that you said and see what things actually happen. But one thing you're going to see in this presentation, and I'm sure you're all aware of it anyway, and that is to expect disruption. We are in a global marketplace where we are constantly facing disruption, particularly of a digital nature. And we'll be looking at some of those points through, through this session today. And if you've got any questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll get to them at the end and people can turn their cameras on as well if they want to. All right, so I'm going to, now I'm, this is classic of me. I say I'm going to do 10 predictions or 10 trends, but I'm actually gonna do 11. I always like to add an extra one on the end and most people seem to then remember the 11th one, the final one that I'll be talking about. So I will go through these at pace. I'm going to try and highlight some of the key aspects in each of these areas, but it's trying to give you as much of a flavour as some of the big trends that you should be aware of in a relatively short space of time. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is kind of, kind of pretty much up to date, and that is the metaverse. So I'm sure that unless you're hiding under a stone somewhere, you'll be very aware of the metaverse. Now, the big question is for many people is what is it? What is this so-called metaverse? We've heard a lot about it because of Facebook, but it's something that's been around for a long time. It's not new. And I would say at the moment we are at peak metaverse hype. But effectively, it's a very loose term for a virtual reality, augmented reality world, a place that you probably see on if you think about um, movies where people live in virtual reality or augmented reality. It's that kind of environment, but it's somewhere that you can work, that you can play, that you can have meetings, you can converse and do your social media in one single place, a, a whole kind of metaverse that's online. Now, why now? Because this has been around for, for over a decade as a concept. Why now? And, and I think there's, there's three reasons for this. First of all, Facebook has decided that they're having trouble and they're thinking, what's the future going to be? Let's see if we can shape that future. And they're getting behind it with the might you know, of the biggest social media organization in the world. You've also seen augmented reality, virtual reality, which has been around for a long time. It started to get to the point where it actually now can deliver 
And I put in here about Oculus price. So Oculus is Facebook's brand. They bought that product, uh, which is the virtual reality, augmented reality headsets. They're at a price now where it's mainstream delivering high quality. So this is a trend which I do think we need to be aware of. Now, what's going on with the whole Facebook meta rebranding? Well, a lot of this is, is down to Facebook's got what we call first party data. And that means they understand more about you than probably most do because you need to log into Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp with your information so they know about your profile, your psychographics, what you like, the interests you have. They know all that information. So in terms of a sellable advertising platform, they are extremely strong, particularly as we face what we call a death of the third party cookie. Governments around the world are putting pressure on organizations like Google and trying to stop them tracking people. But if you have to sign into an app, so one of the Facebook or Meta suite, then they've got that information. And, and Facebook wants to move to a complete ecosystem. They already want you to do everything in that place that you possibly can. They want you to shop there, look after your money there. They want you to have your conversations, do business there because they've got business apps. They want to do everything in one place. And effectively, they're copying some of the super apps which come out of the Far East, um, like WeChat, for example, where you do everything in one ecosystem. So you probably need to be there early if you're interested. Consider now how you do marketing within that meta suite of apps and try and think about customer experiences, particularly when you look at, I mean, there's, there's, there's some fantastic things you can do with WhatsApp as a customer service tool. Start thinking about what can I do with all of this to improve um, customer services. Now, if you look at the metaverse, because this is quite interesting, who's playing? So we know already Disney are in there. Um, JP Morgan in the last week have, have announced that they are going to be the first bank. So effectively, pop your headset on, walk down one of the streets, and pop into Onyx, Onyx, which is um, the JP Morgan's bank, and then do business with them. So we know Facebook's there as well, and Microsoft is there. Microsoft already looking at integrating all of this within Teams. So in the future, you'll pop your headset on and we'll all be sitting in a room together rather than staring at a single dimension screen like this. So big organizations are actually there as well, which kind of gives you that, that uh, focus that it's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. Just give me a second while I see where my mouse is. Great, so number two, and, and this is really just in overall about digital transformation. We, we are moving into a digital world. I think we're at that point now where there is no such thing as an organization that isn't a digital organization. It might They might not be optimizing that, but every single business, whether you're a B2B, B2Consumer, whether you're a small brand, a small to medium enterprise, you are a digital business. And already, if you look at global stock exchanges around the world, they are already classifying these businesses are digital and doing really well. These are not. And the share prices are starting to reflect where the, the stock markets don't believe that those organizations have become digital quickly enough. So you can see that pressure around the world. And this, this chart here just effectively shows you the, the digital laggards on the left hand side, the ones that haven't made that jump. Typically now, when you look at this index here, it's about 3% of organizations that are, that are lagging behind when they've looked at global businesses. So you've got followers, evaluators and digital adopters, but a very small number of organizations which are classed as digital leaders. But the key thing here is that there are very few um, digital laggards. So what are you going to do in, in that action as you're shifting towards, towards digital? And I will talk in, in a, a couple of slides about what I call the COVID accelerator, because that's partly been why we're moving so fast into digital. Strengthen your cybersecurity, reinvent. I'm going to keep coming back to consumer because I'm in marketing. Reinvent your customer journey, how you deal with customers, how you give them value. Use the data, which we'll touch on in a while in new ways, and try and transform your service model, how you give people service. Maybe use some of those uh, meta apps, maybe use chatbots, which I think we may also have a chance to talk about today as well. 
If I look at um, digital trends, looking at the, the, this is my third point, the top five predicted behavior change. So we know that the world has changed over the last two years. It's become a different place. But how many of those behaviors are going to carry on? So working from home is something which many people are doing still. You're perhaps dialing in today. I'm actually at home now, but I, I've been in the office um, at least four days a week. But one day a week, I, I come at home now, work from, the, from home rather than the office. The increasing amount of online shopping, which I'm going to look at in a minute, is here to stay and will be global. Very interesting is that we, we look at organizations like Amazon and you, and you think, can they get any bigger? Can they get any bigger than they are now? The answer is yes, frankly, because if you look at the total markets they're in, they are still not in dozens and dozens of large markets around the world. And I don't think many organizations would, would bet against Amazon entering new marketplaces and taking a similar market share that they have done in the UK and in Europe and in America and so on. So yeah, online shopping is here to stay. Um, increased attention paid to how companies treat customers and employees. So that whole idea about how organizations act, what their values are like, reduced in-store shopping. And the last one here, this could be my 11th point later about health and wellness related products. We are, we've already seen a huge change in that area. And I think digital disruption is going to mean that there's a lot of opportunities for organizations that are in health and wellness based products. So I, I mentioned for this phrase and, and I use it, the COVID accelerator. So this is a chart which I've used a number of times. And, and at, at one point in 2020, this is UK online spend was at 30%. So 30% of everything spent in the UK was being spent online. Now we expected to get to that in four years time and it's happened already. And that's the COVID accelerator that, that actually just through organizations into you need to be digital, you need to be operating online. So that retail transformation is happening now and it's really interesting. I, I could do a whole session on digital retail and looking at e-tail and different types, but I'm going to give you a flavor of that tonight. There's a scary thing, you know, I could put a slide up of the, the trillion dollar club, those organizations that, that are worth over a trillion dollar uh, at market capitalization, bigger than a lot of global economies, single organizations, bigger than whole economies, the whole GDPs from large, large countries. But there you've seen it, 2020, Amazon um, plus 51 percent year on year in terms of its net sales. That's scary when you have a look at that kind of growth rate. And we've seen them continue to grow, not at that pace, but you've seen a continued growth. Now, what I would say, and I find this, this really interesting, is that when you're thinking about digital transformation, and here I'm looking at retail transformation, always think about traditional sectors. Don't think always about the digital stuff. Think about what traditional sectors could be disrupted. And here's a, a slide from Euromonitor International, and they're saying this is where there's an unmet opportunity. Fresh food, yeah, you, you know, in, this, in the UK, I know people are dialing in in other countries, there's lots of options, but around the world, a lot of fresh food is still not um, sold and marketed online. Home and garden, packaged food, consumer electronics, alcoholic drinks. We have seen more model where people again direct to consumer, for example, personal accessories and clothing and footwear. So you see there's still a lot of traditional sectors which have not been fully digitized online. Now, I can't I can't like I said I couldn't go through all of these things, but I want to touch on retail transformation, what to look for and um, emerging business models, you know, memberships, subscriptions. I'll give a, a couple of examples of this direct to consumer. This idea that you no longer need to be able to go through an intermediary that you can go direct to your consumers um, and then on new commerce, all in one super apps. So this is the WeChat. This is what Meta want to do. And then on expanding channels, two of the really interesting things which are emerging is social commerce and live selling. Live selling is interesting, it's fascinating, and the data showing it's very successful. It's effectively taking those old sales channels like QVC and putting them live in more targeted areas where consumers are really interested in interacting with organizations. And a lot of that's done through social media and social selling channels. So let's have a look at some examples. Here's some 
retail transformation slide here. Um, and, I, and I have literally um, just put a few examples on here for you. Um, on the left hand side, you've got, you've got social selling here. This is on um, Chinese sites, AliExpress. You can see there's some of these live streaming. You've got direct consumer, so you've got clothing and you've also got toilet rolls. Um, and I've put Nike up here because when, when we talk about direct consumer, people always think about challenger brands. They think, what, what what are the challenger brands? But but Nike have been doing this really quietly in the background that 35 percent of their total global sales are now direct to consumer, not through retail. And their aim is to get that to 50 percent. Their direct to consumer sales in the last 12 months are growing at 85 percent year on year. So they're not just waiting for the challenger brands to do this. And then also we've got um, the, I can't remember but the I'll run the the runway, which is about renting clothes as well. Really successful, um, really successful sectors. And, and like I said already, you know, traditional categories are ripe. I always like looking at talking about direct glasses online because that's a channel where most people would say to you, no, people aren't going to buy glasses online, but they do and they're very successful as well. I'm going to touch on health a bit later, but Cinch is another one of those big market shifts. They are changing the way consumers are buying cars. They're taking away risk. They're making it easy to shop. They're giving consumers the option to send the car back as well. Why would you want to go to a showroom when they can deliver the car you want at the price you want it outside your house? And if you don't like it, you don't have to argue with a salesman. You just send it back in a week's time. And that's not a problem. They are they are disrupting the marketplace as well. So that's it. You know, cars, glasses, traditional sectors. All of this comes down to adding value at a consumer level. So, so this is it. Don't be blinded by technology. Don't be like astounded by what you're saying. This is a brilliant idea. Think, does it add value at consumer level? My customers, my consumers, is it adding something to them? If it doesn't, it's probably not worth pursuing. So um, key takeaways from this, because I, I, I really like this area of, of where we're seeing um, online retail going. Explore new ways of engaging your consumers, including social commerce and live selling. Act quick, you know, act quick to, to ramp up your digital operations. Get in there. Don't leave it too late. Act before it's too late to pivot. And then, then you're one of the traditional um, organizations that are probably sitting in that laggards area, as I talked about before. Explore how technology can be leveraged to improve efficiencies or the customer experience, because that's what we're really about, enriching customer experience. And look at the digital journey. So what I mean by digital journey is the touch points right throughout your organization for consumers. What are all those touch points? Are they as good as they possibly could be, even within your website, even with the way you communicate with them? Are you doing enough to take away any pain that your consumers have? Because you have a much greater chance of keeping them and stopping them going to um, some of your competitors. Now, I've um, been talking about this for years and it's still not going away. Um, and and I, again, I do I do a quite a, a large presentation on dark social media. It's not scary, but I always want to make sure people are thinking about this. When you look at the amount of time that people spend on social media, it's not in the classic sites that we think about, the classic channels. Uh, so normally you'd go to conferences and talks like this and people will be talking about Facebook, Instagram. They'll be talking about YouTube. They will talk about Twitter and they will talk about TikTok, those channels. Consumers don't spend all of their time there. Most of their time and most of their conversations about brands, goods, products, services, whether it's good or bad, are on what we call dark social media. And that means that they are channels that we can't track. So that's WhatsApp, text messaging, emails, Snapchat, WeChat, um, if, you're, if you're in China. Those apps is where they're spending their time and they are talking about brands. If later you check your own, have a look what people are saying. You'll see people recommending maybe drinks, maybe recommending a movie, recommending somewhere for you to go. And, and that is absolutely crucial. And you need to think about how can you generate conversations in these dark spaces? Because this is, is much more influential than some of the other channels that people work in. I, I will touch on big data. This is not going to be a big data session, but I just like to 
demystify it. I was talking with some organisations today about this and giving them an example of a project that I was involved in. Um, there's more generated, more data now generated than the last two year in the last two years than the entire history of mankind, and that's pretty scary. Now, the majority of marketeers, that's that's where I'm classed as, struggle to cope with big data. And the average amount of data that a marketer uses is about 3.4 sources. You can't track and use everything. It just becomes overwhelming. So you need to focus on what can you use for decision making? And you know, if you think about all the metrics which you have available, what can you actually use for decision making? Stop tracking things that don't lead you to a decision. So I, I always say to organizations, add a new data source. And hopefully, if possible, that data source might be about insights into your consumers. So it might be about what are they interested in? What are, what are their pain points? What are their passions? Just try and find something extra to add rather than thinking about how am I going to make decisions? So I've just got there a list which you could have a look at you know, where their locations are, what they're searching for using search data, first party social data. So if you're on a platform like Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, their passions and mindsets, you know, what do they care about the most of all? And are you aligned to that? Because are you what they love or could you help them improve what they love? Who influences those consumers and your customers? And, and, and are you working with those um, as well? OK, and, and, and this is what I mean by, you know, consumers are driven by their passions. And, and when we think about our audience, quite often in marketing, you know, we'll talk about persona development or insights. And we think about age, where they live, where their income is, what their education is. That doesn't really tell us much about our consumers. But you can see here two profiles. Where do they shop? What do they care about? Who are their influencers? What else do they do? starts building up a really rich picture and you can get lots of this data through first party data and um, on social channels and starting to blend that with what you know can add real value rather than you thinking I need to analyze all of this big data. My seventh point here is short form video okay and, and it's not just about TikTok which is why I'm saying it's short form video because this has been happening for, for for, for many years now, we've been moving to what I've called the attention economy. You know, they, gone are the days where people will spend a long time looking at things and actually tolerating long advertising. And, and this is becoming key, particularly amongst young audiences. And ad lengths are getting shorter. Insight videos are getting shorter. You know, so if you might you know, have different businesses around here, I'm sure. And some of your content might not always be hero content about exciting things. It might just be about how do you do something? How does something work? But you need to think about how can we deliver that in shorter chunks, which is get to get attention, get your brand over and um, to consumers. And the interesting research is that actually six seconds can be effective. Now that's quite scary but what you think you can deliver in six seconds, but it can be effective. So you do need to have like your key messaging, the right colors, the right kind of branding and ensure that you're consistent so that consumers know who's actually talking to you. And, and I would say that um, really interesting data which we're getting from TikTok now, it's hugely effective. It's one of the most effective conversion social media channels. And, and it's all about if you create great TikToks, which are entertaining to the right audience, they don't care if it's an advert or not. It's not like that. If you, if you create proper TikToks, they don't mind that, that it's an intrusive ad. If it's interesting, the click through rates, the conversion rates are very high much higher than we see in Facebook and Instagram, for example. And all of this means that doesn't matter how short it is, create great content. And then I, this term atomization means breaking it down and thinking, what other platforms can I put this brilliant content on? So you might start with large form, but you always need to think about how can I get short form video into here as well. Um, now, I, I will always talk about, about influencer marketing too, because it's not, it's not going away. We, we have this big issue here with influencer marketing. In fact, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to come back to this slide. I'm going to I'm going to just show you this one first, because because the term influencer marketing is damaging 
because because as soon as you start talking about influencer marketing, the eyes roll. People think about celebrities and um, reality show celebrities, those type of things, and people that are just out to make money. And and it, you lose audiences when you talk about influencer marketing. But that's not what it really should be about. You know, when you look at a history of influencers. For, for all of my career in marketing, we used to call them key opinion leaders or opinion leaders. They're the same thing. It's just as a new phrase, but they're about people that have influence. And you look at this, you know, it never used to be a job. It used to be something that you had and everyone has influence of some sort, but some will have a greater level of influence than, than others. And the data shows people trust them and are more likely to do what they say or to try things or to behave in a certain way if somebody they trust and has knowledge knows about it. So don't always think, OK, he's talking about influences. He's talking about the Kardashians. No, I'm not talking about some other things. They reach more consumers and customers than you can because they fly under the radar of algorithms. People pull their content rather than it being forced on them as well. And, and effectively, we know they're more trusted, but this is the electronic thing, the electronic version of what people have been doing forever. And that is having conversations, telling people about things, telling them not what to do as well, telling them to things to avoid because of bad experiences. And, and here's the data, 75% of advertisers say they're working with influencers with a $20 billion spend last year. This is not something that's just going to disappear. But what I always say to business is, try and find out who they are. Now, I am sure there'll be someone here that's got a really unusual business to business brand and go, oh, we don't have any. You will have, because I know that one of, one of the projects we did with an organization that made um, industrial adhesives. So this is glue which sticks things together on production lines, we found out that people were talking about those brands online and they were giving recommendations. So there are influencers, so they will always be there. Don't treat them like a channel. Don't think, oh, OK, I've got advertising, I've got my YouTube stuff, I've got my leaflets, I've got my posters and I've got my influencers. Don't treat them like um, a channel and avoid influencer platforms as well. Understand what they really want and what they really love and collaborate and work with them because they should be content creators and they will love that, that idea of being able to work with organisations that they care about, sectors they care about producing content. So this is the way to approach it rather than thinking of it as a channel. Okay, I'm at number nine, I'm getting there. Um, automation, so, so, so artificial intelligence, automation, you know, 90% of business say that this is going to change their organisation. The reality is less than 25% actually have a strategy. They're not sure exactly what they need to be automating and what they're going to do. Now, now it's here to help and not to replace humans. It's not going to take out all the jobs that people say. Certainly in some sectors, you know, AI is not going to do this. But I think it's it's essential in dealing with increasing amounts of data and customer data, customer services and other things. We need to be having automated dashboards telling us sentiments, telling us what are happening. And this is where AI can come through. So if you've got AI doing kind of the grunt work on the data and the information, then you can spend more time on innovation, big ideas, customer service, being creative finding new revenue streams and business opportunities rather than doing something that you may be able to automate. So I do encourage um, all organisations to think, you know, what, what parts of our business could we invest in to automate? It's not straightforward because of cleaning data and so on, but it's worthwhile. And, and, and the key thing here, um, it's really interesting. I was just looking at last week, some organisations a few years ago, we talk about chatbots and they've all got them now. And, and I would say this is this is a really good step. They're easy to do. They're relatively low cost, but you can start to automate key questions that consumers have. You know, most most consumers don't actually want to talk to companies or most customers don't. You know, if they want to know what time you open or how long it takes for something to be delivered, they just want that information quickly. They don't want to send an email in or even go on an online chat. They just want to say what time you open, where are you? Um, can somebody answer this question? They want that kind of thing answered quickly. So think about what can you do to automate key consumer or customer questions. So my 10th point here, and it's back to early on where we were talking about AR, VR. 
it's been around for a long time, an awful long time. And I, I think back at the blocky graphics, the poor execution and the promise of living in a, in a virtual augmented world. And it now looks like it's happening, you know, so you've got the big companies, Google and Apple in, and Samsung integrating this in phone technology. I talked before about Oculus price coming down and apps really working. It looks like it's finally showing the potential which people promised about before. It's been slow to take off. Now, more than 40 percent of global industry professionals expect to see growth in this area in the next five years. And we started to see again, COVID-19 is the game changer. This is where we started to see innovation coming in because it's kind of forced in because people are having to change their behavior. You think about giving your customers added value, enhance their everyday experience if possible. And, and you can see some of the data, I don't need to read this through, but you can see industry expect that it's going to be used in some ways to either replicate or enhance physical experiences. So I've got some, some uh, nice um, examples here just to show you as well. Um, this is a really, really good example where, you know, you look at those sectors which are hard to buy online, and one of them is shoes. You know, people say, I'm not gonna buy shoes online, I like to try them on. And, and there are apps which will do 3D scanning of your own, own phone, and they've got databases of shoe manufacturers, and they can tell you, this is the size that you need. And then you can go and buy those online. It's a really nice way of saying, how can I use augmented reality in a way that adds values to consumers? And there's going to be a lot more of that coming. So my 11th point, because I said to you, I would throw in a, a, an extra one on top of my 10. And it's it's digital health. You know, already digital health and well-being is, is valued at $120 billion and it's growing at 29% over the next five years. Year on year, we are going to see that continued growth in here. Um, a, a lot of this is mobile health support. You're going to see preventative digital health. You know, the consumers nowadays with smart devices will know more about their health than whole generations have beforehand. And you've got self-care and food and diet is extremely well documented. And again, the, the reason why, I mean, this was happening anyway, this was already happening, but the shift of COVID, which has forced people to go online for consultations, to find out information, and then to self-test at home, has shifted millions of people around the world into accepting an online healthcare experience. Now, we might not always want that, but when you think about, I'm sure most of you have done a lateral flow test at some point, because of my job, I have to do it twice a week. Um, it's, it's over 20 steps. If you had said to people before that you're gonna go through all these 20 steps, stick things in your mouth and up your nose, put it into this, put it onto a thing, wait for 20 minutes, scan a code, upload it, most consumers would have said no. But now you've got to a point where millions and millions of consumers have done that. So the step to do lots more home diagnostics is not a big step at all. So you expect to see a lot of movement in here. So I've just got a, a few examples here to share with you. And, and, and you might be thinking, oh, this is quite interesting, but how is this going to affect me? But it might affect you. You may have a product, a good or a service. You might be in an agency or something that may have a link in some way or other to health, mental health, well-being, illness prevention, or, or even goods or services in this area. You might do. And I think it's worth thinking it through and thinking, have we got opportunities in this area? But you can see here, so you've got mobile, mental health support, Calm valued at $2 billion, 100 million downloads, Headspace, billion dollars. These are apps to help with mental health. Prevented digital health, smart wearables, and I love this. Um, so, I mean, I, I wear a Garmin watch. That's an advert for the night. Um, in the first lockdown, because of the data they had, they were producing global data on how activity was changing. And they were saying, okay, the number of 5K runs were dropping, but the, but um, floor repeats were going through the roof. And, and you realize, blimey, they've got this global data of how people are behaving. It's all being uploaded. It's all being anonymized. So they're not saying, you know, Peter Andrews is running up and down his stairs every day, but it's incredible how much data that there is now from wearables. Online health, 
And I, I did a, a quiz with some of my students last week and I asked them, you know, what was the most downloaded app in the UK in the last year? To which they all said TikTok, which was wrong. It was the NHS app, which had 20 million downloads. So all of a sudden, because we had to, you have millions of people with an NHS, uh, NHS app in their pockets. And NHS will become digital first. That's where it's heading. It will be, that's the first way. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, will triage people. You will plug all that information in and it will say to you, this is where, this is where we're going to be. And online consultations, we've all done that as well. And there's a big shift in that area. Then the final one there was home testing. And it's not new because I uh, oh, over a decade ago, I worked with a home testing organization in terms of allergies. But that is going to accelerate. So this is a hope that that example there is um, there are subscription services where you subscribe, you pay so much per month and you decide which diagnostic tests you want. And then they will keep a record of that and they will be able to track it for you and give you feedback and give you online consultations with nurses and other things. But that is going to grow. And that's particularly because how everyone now is like at home, lateral flow test. Yeah, of course, I can do a pinprick. I can put this into a into a pot and I can do other things as well. So I expect that that's going to be a really interesting area for the future. One thing I would say to you all is, is invest. I, I like to show about the digital marketing trends and the skills gap is that organisations are saying we have got gaps in all of these digital areas, huge gaps. And they're, they're, we're looking for the next generation. We're looking for people to upskill. You know, it's great to work with organisations like university who've got lots of talent which are coming out. So I know you're all alumni from the university as well. But it's thinking about upskilling and employing the people that have got these skills that you're going to need in organisations. And I know, you know, we run digital marketing modules at University of Hull, and, and the employability is sky high in all of those areas. We have lots of organisations coming to us asking for people and you'll find that the employability is very very high because these skills are in great demand so my final thoughts here are innovate with urgency don't stand still and and disrupt yourself before someone else does that's one of my really key mantras sometimes people don't do it because they are they're waiting for something to happen or they're saying it will cannibalize my build my my business well it will cannibalize your own business before somebody else cannibalizes it. It's much better to be in that situation because somebody else is trying to get your customers, trying to win your business. And hopefully some of these digital trends have been helpful. I mean, how can we help you at Hull? You, you know you know a lot about us. And um, you know, we can work with organizations, identify opportunities, innovation, research projects. And we're really happy to run um, masterclasses such as this in social media, digital, and customer experience. So that leads everything for me. And as I said, you know, brace yourself for unprecedented upheaval. But one thing I would say is most of this is positive. You know, it's, it's like if you think in marketing, it never stands still. It's never been the same as the year before ever. And once you get into that cycle of change, it's an exciting place to be in and just make sure you're keeping up to date and aware and choose the trends that are important to you. And as I said before, choose those trends which you believe is going to add value at a customer or a consumer level. OK, so I think I said I would do about 40 minutes. So I know race through those things today. So um, let me know if you've got any questions. I can see um, a few points on here already. Yep. Yeah, things like ECG on your watch, keep an eye on your heart rate. Yeah, so I mean, I have a heart rate monitor on here. This has got a pulse oxometer on it as well. So it can, it can tell me whether I have enough blood oxygen, how accurate it is, I don't know. Um, but, but yeah, you have a lot of that data. OK, Matt's got examples there. Um, NHS, huge push in getting patients to wait well, accessing patients before they're ill. Yeah, that the whole push for wellness. So has anyone got any questions for me? Uh, Peter, I thought that was really fascinating and, and also really enjoyable to sort of go through all those points. And uh, one of the questions I thought, well, I, I was thinking is like some of the technology, the technological shifts we're looking at, 
is this a paradigm shift in, in, in what's possible or is it just a more of a, a steady development in terms of what's already been happening uh, over the last 10 and 15 years? Now, so, I mean, that's a good question, isn't it? Because because people always people always talk about we're living in an unprecedented age, but people have been saying that forever. <laughs> um, you know, so if you go back, there's some really, I, sorry, I'm not that old, but if you go back to Herodotus, those things were being written in ancient Greece about we're in an unprecedented age of change and development. Uh, this, the pace is quicker. I, I don't feel like it's been like a, a cliff edge of change. It's been accelerated in the last year and the pace is faster. That's that's the key thing I would say. It's much quicker. And, and on some of these talks, I look at change and it, and it took like 50 years to, to get 50 million people to own a radio. So just having a radio in the house, whereas now it, it takes like, you know, a month for 50 million people to download Candy Crush, for example. So that pace, I think, is, is the key thing. But I, I don't feel like we're like at a, a cliff edge. We're, we're always in tipping points. And that's why I say when you look at something like augmented reality and virtual reality, it's been around for a long time. And now does it feel like, OK, we're on, we're on a tipping point and um, home testing, home health. These things been around for decades, probably and done by direct mail and other things. But again, are we now at a point where the technology has converged to enable us to do it? Um, yeah, there, there is this. So you've got here the trend is for consumers to have more control. How will it impact? So um, I, I touched on this before briefly early on. Th this hasn't so, so GDPR puts more control in consumers' hands. So what this effectively means is that in terms of how companies use your data and keep that data, you've got to give them approval for it. That means that consumers are asked every time they go onto a website, are you happy? Consumers tell you they can't stand that message. <laughs> they, they don't like that message. The, the truth is that most organizations want to track you and want your data to give you a better experience. So that might feel creepy sometimes, but the truth is they want to give a better experience to you. If you took away all tracking and all data, you will largely see adverts for gambling websites and dating services. That's what you'll see, because those are the ones that will just buy anything. And that, that's where we end up with. And then, then you'll ask yourself, well, is this actually a better experience than I got that if I was tracked? Now, the, the reason why it doesn't impact these trends so much. So, so far, Google are under pressure to take away. So Apple privacy settings we've got there. So basically, Apple switches off third party tracking cookies or gives you the option to switch them off. Google's been told they really need to do this as well. But they're going to capture that data in other ways. So, so don't don't be concerned that it's going to all go away. But what this has done is it's putting more power into those organizations that capture your first party data. So like Facebook, for example, because they can switch the cookies off. But but you've already signed up a massive great agreement that Facebook can use all of your data and sell it and track you and do all sorts of things. And you can only get into Facebook when you sign in. Now, I know you can switch everything off, but people don't. So what this is actually doing is it's putting a lot more power into organizations that have first party data. So um, Snapchat, uh, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, um, Twitter, you can use without logging in. But do you see what I mean? And actually, we've got some about Amazon here as well. Amazon's another one of these is that they have first party data. Don't think of Amazon just as a retailer because they make more money in certain categories out of advertising than they do out of selling products. And they've got your first party data because you logged in and they know what you've bought, what you've looked at, what you've compared, what videos you're watching on on their site. And so it actually is putting more power into other global behemoths. <laughs> so it's not taking it away, it's just putting it in other places, um, which is a real challenge. Um, so I, hopefully that, that has helped. 
You mentioned employment conditions um, and online retailers. Yeah, sustainability. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is always a challenge, isn't it? Because you know, I've been very much targeted looking at at digital trends, but but I said already that that I can't say all consumers, but consumers are becoming more concerned about values, the values of the organisations they purchase from, the brand purpose that a business has. Now that's not for every sector, because as we're all consumers, as consumers, if we acted that way in shopping for everything, we just can't do it. We can't process having to think through every single decision we make about brand purpose or brand value. But there are many sectors which people are doing that. You know, they're making decisions and choices. And, and what you're seeing is that these big global businesses are making improvements. Amazon's being forced perhaps, I don't know if anyone works Amazon here, but you know, even at warehouses, because of shortage of staff and turnover, they are making improvements and they're probably spending more money on solar energy, electrification of vehicles. So, so they are working in these areas, but um, you know, ultimately you're right, the consumers have got the decision. They decide where they will want to spend and where they won't. OK, and demographics of target groups, um, e.g. generator not used to that extent of digitalization with high buying power. This is really interesting. OK, so so when we say demographics, so you know, academically in marketing, we're talking about age, things we can absolutely measure. So how old you are, where you live, how much income you've got, those type of things. And, and I think that you've got to look at your target audience and don't make assumptions, look at data. Because most of the data that I see, because I see things particularly on LinkedIn where they say, know your generations, and they say people over 60 and 70 aren't using social media and aren't shopping online. That's not true. They are. So they are shopping online. They are booking their holidays online. They are Google searching health issues and health challenges. So I think it's all about there will always be some audiences, particularly if you work in social care, social health, there are people that could lag behind and that's a real concern. And that's a real concern for, for healthcare and for social care, making sure that these people then don't have digital poverty. And that is a, that is a big challenge. I know I'm covering a lot here, um, but that is, that's a real challenge. But, but actually quite quite a large percentage of people that are in those older age groups are very digital savvy as well. Um, oh, brilliant, Alexander, Alexandra, you're in um, data and analytics, lots of strategic partners, yet yeah, one of them being Amazon. Is that because that'll be um, Amazon Web Services, I expect? So they might control the cloud behind. So Alexander, you have to drop me an email. One of my colleagues uh, has done a lot of data and research um, with NHS and uh, he'd be probably really interested in, in catching up with you as well. Um, yeah, lots of analytics and data. What's a good way to point traffic to website without spending money? Oh, that's quite hard. Um, so, OK, you, you've got you, you really in this instance, you, you need to use social media. So you can pay which is which is one way around it. Uh, but you really need to use social media and, and um, you'll find also that platforms like Google. So if you want to do paid search, they will have um, a charity offering where they will give you some free credit as well, maybe 250 pounds or something. So you can Google that. You should be able to find out where they will help charities and say, OK, so that's AdWords. So if people are searching for things in a certain area and um, you should be able to get some of that. But, but really, I, for this kind of thing, you don't have a lot of money, I, I would use social media, word of mouth, just approach people, get them to talk about it, make posts and try and share it that way, because that's most likely to be successful. And um, but I would look to see if you can get any free credit for online advertising from Google and um, they, they might well and that might help give you some of that momentum. Um, do you have any tips for engaging an audience who are social media adverse? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's it's always it's always a challenge because because the, the, the term engaging means it's two way and there aren't many media that can do that in the same way. 
So, so it really is understanding your audience. So I don't know if this is probably in health and, and it's finding out where they are, what their touch points are and how you can communicate to them. You know, so it can be, it, it'll all depend on who they are and where they are. You know, if you can find clusters of where they meet together, because you're going to be relying on traditional media, maybe presentations, maybe print posters, those type of things. If they don't want to engage in digital social media, of which there will be people, particularly in a social context, then it's finding out what other media do they consume and how can you influence them in that way? I know that's a very broad, but we need to know exactly who they are. Um, so when it comes to paid advertising, do you think it holds the same power? Um, yes, is the answer. Um, it, it can do. So, so paid means, it, paid gives you reach because you know if you're paying for it, it's going to, going to happen. So whether that's traditional offline or if it's online advertising, you know it's going to happen. But but there is so much research that, that that tells you that paid still has a really strong role to play. And, and part of that is because social is never guaranteed to happen. You know, if you think we're going to have a, a brilliant viral video, OK, it, it, there's no guarantee it's going to be viral. Or well, there's no guarantee that people are going to talk about your brand and share about it. And, and when you look at the channels, say you want to reach people through social and you've got, say, um, say you're choosing um, you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I can say YouTube as well. Say, say YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, TikTok. They have an algorithm which means that not everyone that you think is going to see that are going to see it. So you'd expect that, say you had a thousand followers, most brands, unless they're really connected, are going to struggle to get over a hundred of their followers actually seeing it. So how do you then reach more? And so they're set up as advertising platforms. So paid means you can either boost those posts to get to your audience, or you can advertise and reach new audiences. But the word how noisy the industry is, is absolutely right. You know, we're, we're bombarded typically in the West with 5,000 messages a day. That's what we typically think that we're bombarded with. So how do you get cut through when you have 5,000 messages coming at you? And I think this is why if you're running campaigns, I'm looking particularly at that, you've got to have big ideas that get cut through that are interesting, that people want to share and um, rather than, you know, relying on on posts being shared. Uh, there you go. I, I haven't read that Google link, but have a look. Yeah, have, have, a, have a look around. Um, but you'll find either through Google Direct or depending where you are, search for small Google agencies and they'll be able to get some free vouchers as well, typically 250 pounds, which if your website is got a very discreet target audience and you're in a specific area, could buy you some nice coverage and get people that maybe are searching because you're buying key search terms that maybe are searching for some help in domestic abuse might find. So worth worth trying. OK, all right. I know I'm rattling through these. I'm hopefully I'm answering your questions. Um, are there any others? I think Alexander's just typing another question there, Peter. Okay. And, and Matt as well. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying about, you know, like with with um, Meta, like sort of like looking to expand to be like more of an ecosystem and to have every everything in one place. Like, it was it WeChat that you yeah. you compared it to? Um, what to what extent as well do you think that maybe like have like given up ha the hardware as well like not just the software and the apps but but the the the, the device that people are using is going to sort of like change the way we interact with with them because I mean obviously Amazon has its own hardware Apple's mm -hmm. famous in its own sort of ecosystem of devices and stuff do you think that's going to impact I think it it can I mean I mean uh, you know whilst they they are losing. A number of visits on Facebook and Instagram, 
there's still strong platforms that will need to exist in whatever shape they are in, in other ecosystems. But but I think you're right. And um, I'm, I'm sure some people here might be aware, but um, Apple's already moving towards that subscription service that basically don't buy a phone, pay a monthly fee. We'll give you a phone every two years and you'll get your phone calls included, you'll get Apple TV, Apple Music, and a few other things all thrown in. So, you know, where, where will they go? Because they are in that, that technology area of selling physical product and software. So I, I think it, you know, how much of it will go, I, I'm really not sure. I do think that, that what Facebook or Meta have done with having Oculus and getting it down to a price point which is affordable and the quality is high enough, I think could have a dramatic impact. So I don't, I mean, I know a lot of people that seem to have bought this for Christmas. It kind of, and I expect next year that'll be the same case, that it will be the kind of the Christmas gift that people will have and you'll see uptake in households as people get them and then want to meet people in that same space as well. What's my biggest concern about the metaverse? I I, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really difficult because we are at the hype, the point of hype where everyone is talking about it and obscene amounts of money is being spent on virtual real estate. And that's, I, I, I have to be brutally honest, I am terrible at predicting the financial stuff. You know, I, I, you know, non-fungible tokens, Bitcoin and things like that, that has not been my my expertise. I'm great at talking about consumers and understanding where consumer trends go. But when it comes to the big financial things, I've not had the best track record <laughs> of telling people what I think is going to really work. Um, yeah, you froze. What's your standpoint on it? Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I mean, the, we are already living in an online offline world. And, and I do believe in a lot of ways it could be pretty good, you know, it could be excellent at connecting with people and doing certain things in a more realistic way. So I think the fear is, if there's any psychologist here, is what does it do then? You know, what does it do if everybody spends more of their time in a virtual world and struggle with that, that physical world and communicating and interacting with people? That's probably one of the fears that I would have. Do, do I see it working B2B? Yeah, I, I think I see everything working in B2B. I, I really do. I think that, the, for example, when you look at B2B, you think about um, leads, don't you? Lead generation, lead conversion. And I can see in those kind of environments where people might have conversations, have demonstrations of how things work, you know, from a, from a, a field that could be much wider than it is now. So, you know, commonly, if you want to speak to somebody, have a conversation, meet with them, you might be doing that over Teams now. I could easily see that being happening in the metaverse, but then also showing products, showing goods, showing services, demonstrating things, I think could be really quite interesting. And I think organizations might find that. If that area is, we, we think of entertainment, but actually I think that some of those areas could be more interesting than maybe consumer shopping which might be a little bit gimmicky at first, you know, walking around and swiping rails. You know, it might, might be interesting at first, but you imagine if you've got a product and you want to demonstrate it to someone and you could do it in an afternoon and without having to travel to the other part of the world or the other part of the UK and just say to somebody, I'll just pop in and we'll just show you how this works. I think I think could be could be a real positive thing. And likewise, that organizations will be able to share in an augmented way if they got questions about something they'll put the headset on and you'll be able to just see you know see exactly what they're seeing and you'll be able to overlay things and say well what happens if i did this would that work for you so you may not have to go onto sites for example maybe think about petrochemical sites you probably won't have to go on the site they'll be able to see somebody be able to overlay in terms of engineering issues and challenges and that's why I actually I think probably B2B it might be might be even more positive than it is on B2C. OK, so I'm just giving yeah, just giving examples that I can think of where 
smartphones are already being used. So it's seeing how much better could it be. Um, and it, yeah, but you imagine it being able to bring engineering experts from around the world to talk to you and see what the, the issue is in like a three dimensional virtual or augmented reality world. OK, it is mind boggling. <laughs> that, that's fascinating, Peter. Thank you very much. I think um, we'll we could go on. I think there's, there's so much we could talk about tonight and so many different avenues we could take it down and questions we could ask. I think we should maybe call it a night now and say thank you very much for, for your time. It's been a fascinating presentation and I really, I really enjoyed it. I know from the comments that are coming through that, that the guests have as well. Um, just to everyone who's joined us tonight, thank you also for joining us. Uh, do let us know what you'd like to see uh, from us in the future. If there's sort of topics you want us to touch upon or masterclasses that you'd like to see, do let us know because we'd obviously love to, to provide that for you. Uh, yeah. Again, if you can join me in, in thanking Peter for, for a great session. No, thank you. And if anybody, I'm easy to find on the whole university website. If anyone needs a follow up, um, I said, Alexandra, I do have a colleague that works in data and big data and has done a lot of work in NHS in the past. And I know, Matt, I've got to catch up with you. You've been extremely busy, so I will be in contact as well. But it's been really good to speak to everyone tonight. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.